So I'd like to introduce to you um, our speaker for, for that retreat. Uh, we had a very special time with him and his wife and also uh, the other couple. Um, his name is Mark Villarreal. He's a former businessman and corporate trainer. Now he serves as the pastor of Christ's Commission Fellowship, overseeing several satellite churches in the Rizal provincial area. Sino yung mga taga Rizal? Antipolo, ganyan, no? Rizal, tama ba? Dami pala. Maybe you have seen him in the church there before. He's also a director and trainer of the World Needs a Father Philippines. His joys are being a husband to his wife, Pita, for 20 years and a father to three young men, Anton, Samuel, and Manu, who are growing in wisdom and character by God's grace. His greatest desire is to please God, his Father, in everything he does. Let's all welcome, with a warm CCF welcome, Pastor Mark Villarreal. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, brother. Well, good morning. Good morning. You know, thank you very much for inviting me to your retreat. And I hope uh, you'll invite me again, hopefully. But it was a wonderful privilege for me to come alongside and get to know a lot of you uh, for the past three days at the Every ne Everyone Needs a Champion retreat. And for those of you, you know, I'm meeting for the first time, you know, again, uh, good morning to all of you. Today, uh, I'm going to speak on a topic which I think is very, very relevant. And this is something that, you know, the Lord has impressed upon my heart. Uh, as you learn during the retreat, one of my advocacies is fatherhood. And this topic that we're going to speak, we're going to talk about is something that is very, something that is affecting our kids, even ourselves as parents. But before that, you know, the Lord impressed me as we were singing to remind all of us, that God reigns. Amen? Amen? God reigns here in Singapore. You know, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God reigns in your heart. And collectively, as we gather together as one body, God reigns here in this place. But do you know that one day, Jesus himself will reign here, literally here on earth? And I don't know if you're excited with that reality that he will reign one day. He will come down here on earth as king. And we will all bow down to him. Literally, we'll see him face to face. And that is something... Are you looking forward to that day? Yes? Okay, so uh, around 25% of you are. But if Jesus is your Lord, your Savior, you should be excited. You know, I don't know about you. So before we proceed, can I invite all of us to just with one heart... One, with one heart I just come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for CCF Singapore and what you are doing here in this church, in this part of the world. Heavenly Father, as we listen to your word, as we worship, continue in worship, Lord, may you humble our hearts. May you elevate our minds so that our spirit can speak to your spirit. Heavenly Father, may you help me as your messenger this morning to speak to your people what they need to hear. Lord, help me to say what I need to say. There is a message that you want to be said. And Father, I acknowledge my inadequacy to effectively communicate what you want to be said to, the, to your people here. But Lord, with your spirit, I know that you will speak to each and every one. Thank you, Lord. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we are commanded to love God. And I know most of you, if not all of you, know that truth, right? We are built for relationships, to love God with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind. We are also commanded to love one another. And a major aspect of love is the word intimacy. So, right? When you think of the word intimacy, what comes to your mind? You know, what does it look like? Being intimate. You know, what does it look like? Anyone? Intimacy. You know, it's okay to communicate. Uh, you know, I just, I'm, I'm not the only one who can speak here. What does it look like? When you think of the word intimacy, being intimate. Close. Okay? Christ is in your heart? Of course, Jesus Christ is in your heart. Jesus Christ is in your heart, sir. 
Amen. Praise God. Any, anything else? Close? Jesus in your heart? There's also what we call sexual intimacy between uh, husband and wife. So there's closeness. There's um, a devotion. There is... And God built that in our heart. We are designed for relationships. So here are some images of intimacy. You know, I just gathered it last night. Uh, between husband and wife, being intimate with one another. As a family, you are intimate with one another, right? With the, with the husband, wife, child. You are intimate with your close friends. That's right. And then you are, we are also designed to be intimate with God. So intimacy connotes closeness, attachment, friendliness, affection, engagement. You are engaged in that relationship. You know, in the past several years, we have grown in intimacy is over one thing. And that is what I call an intimacy with our devices. Because in the same way that we are close to a person, oftentimes we demonstrate closeness to our devices, our computers perhaps, and anything that takes our intimacy means, in other words, what I'm saying is this. God designed us for closeness. And oftentimes today, in this day and age, we are intimate with not only someone, but with something. Because what, the truth is, devices are very attractive. And there's something about them that the designers built that catches our attention and catches our heart. You know, two years ago, in the U.S., they had this docu-series called Undercover High. Now, this docu-series was about a group of adults, young adults, and they went undercover. They went into the public school, high school public school system. They studied. They were undercover as high school students. But actually, they had an agenda. And their, their classmates thought they were students, but actually they were not. They looked very young. But after that docu-series, they came up with these realizations. They discovered something. They discovered that high school today is vastly different from the high school that they once knew. And these are the seven things that they discovered. One is social media has changed the game. The way the young people communicate is through social media. In fact, today, a lot of young people don't go out anymore. They don't learn the skills that we used to do so much. A lot of young people don't know how to bike and stuff like that. In fact, uh, statistics tell us that a lot of teenagers, they are not excited with the fact that one day they will drive a vehicle. There's something about that. So social media changed the game. Teachers have less control. Bullying doesn't stop when the final bell rings. What that simply means is during, well, during my time, you know, bullying only happens in school. But today, bullying does not only happen, it's not confined in the school environment. After you go home, when you check your social media, bullying still continues. You can be bullied right at home. Girls are constantly pressured to share sexual images of themselves. Depression is in record numbers. Teen pregnancy isn't what it used to be. And they just want someone to talk to. Now, if you look at these you know, discoveries, four out of seven has to do with digital addiction or their engagement with digital devices. So usually when I give this talk, this is a half hour talk. So we're gonna be here by, uh, sorry, not half hour, sorry. Usually I give this talk, it's a half day talk. So uh, I don't know if you're excited with that announcement, but we're gonna compress it in, uh, well, maybe 30 minutes or so. But let me give you an outline usually when I give this talk. The basic outline is the major shifts in society that happened in the past 10 or so years. One is ideology, second is technology, and third is sexuality. Just to briefly describe uh, today, we're living in a postmodern, post truth world. Absolute standards are no longer embraced by many of the young people, like, not like what, what we are used to. You know, when I was young, you know, when, when, the, when people in authority say something, I obey. When I was young, the preacher says, the Bible says this, I obey. Today, that no longer applies. When you say to us, a common young person, this is what the Bible says, 
they will say, what, the Bible, you know, is that really true? So there's no longer any standard, all right? And then second is technology. Today we're going to talk about, sorry, technology, right? And third is sexuality. Now many of you are aware of this, you know, the gender neutral issues, gender neutral bathrooms, gender neutral uh, parenting, clothes, but I'm not going to talk about that. But today we're going to look at number two, and that is technology. This is something I think is special and what you need to hear because uh, Singapore is one of the fastest internet, you have one of the fastest internet in the world. Okay, so I praise God that somehow it's a blessing in the Philippines, we have one of the slowest internet, so uh, <laughs> that is a blessing to us. Uh, and I realize that when I'm here, the internet is very fast. But these things, they take away our intimacy from God. And I'm going to explain that this morning. And that's why I want you and I to understand, especially the young people, that you need to go back to the intimacy that God designed for you to have. And that is an intimate relationship with God because these things steal our attention and these things steal our heart. You know, Paul wrote, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. The truth is, once you come to Christ, once you place your faith in Jesus Christ, we are set free. Do you realize that? We are set free from sin, from the penalty of sin. That simply means once you place your faith in Jesus, you are now part of his family. And therefore, what that means is you are heaven bound. That is an assurance, the penalty of sin. At the same time, we are set free from the power of sin. We are liberated. The truth is, many of us used to be controlled by our sinful habits and nature. But after coming to Christ, we are given the power to be free. But that freedom must be used, that freedom is given to us so that we can be mastered by God himself. The problem lies is, sin, is when we are set free, we choose to be mastered by someone or something. And that is what happens to many of us. And our young generation is a victim of it. You know, in the movie Avengers, I watch Avengers too, Loki once said, you were meant to be ruled. You know, he was going to conquer the world, and then he said to the people, bow down to me, you were meant to be ruled. And then Captain America came. Okay, but that's not that story, okay. And you know that's true. That we were meant to be ruled. That is so true. And, and maybe the young people are saying, are you kidding me? In this today of freedom, they, you, you are saying that I am meant to be ruled? You know, God created us. He designed us. And the truth is we are meant to be ruled. We are meant to be ruled by God. But the problem is today, we are ruled by something else. And when that happens, well, when that happens, I'm going to explain later on what is the problem when that situation happens in your life. You know, the average millennial with internet access, well, this is old data because today we're Gen Z already, right? With internet access, it spends 3.2 hours a day on mobile devices, equivalent to 22.4 hours every week. That's 1,168 hours or 49 days over the course of a year. Can you imagine that? Almost in one week, the average millennial almost spends one entire day on the internet. And in one year, 49 days spent on the internet. Whether you admit it or not, we are living in a digitally addicted world. You know, as a counselor, and because a lot of young people are going through depression, one of my advices, I mentioned this during the retreat, is if your child is going through depression and he or she is digitally addicted, one of my suggestions is before consulting a psychiatrist is to do, go on a digital detox. That simply means around six weeks of no gadgets. 
because there's a connection with depression and digital devices. And then when I say that, I say to the parents, that includes you. Because how can your child not, you know, be, be, not do digital devices and while he observes you on your phone? When I say that, it's like the parents, you see a withdrawal symptom. And they so say something like, what do you mean? No device. How can I work? How can I survive without these things? And then I assure them, don't worry, you'll survive. Now, how can I communicate? Well, I give them some ideas. And just basically what I say is when I go on a digital detox, I announce to all my associates in church or uh, professionally in the chat groups, right? I tell them I'm going on a digital detox so you can only communicate to me through text and email. And I take off the SIM card from my smartphone and use what I call a dumb phone. And that's it. And that's risky because, you know, sometimes I miss a meeting because <laughs> even though I make an announcement, some people miss it. But what I tell them, my parents, you know, depression, your child may end up killing herself. So what is more important to you, your job or the life of your child? So the truth is, when I say that, you know, the parents start to shake and say, so it's like, not only is the child addicted, but we are addicted too. So whether we admit it or not, we live in a digitally addicted world. There's video game addiction. There's mobile cell phone addiction. There's texting addiction. Well, actually, this texting addiction means, you know, today we use the messenger, messenger the, uh, app or Viber or uh, what do you use here in Singapore, WhatsApp and the others. What that simply means is we are addicted because we have this condition called FOMO. Have you heard of FOMO? The fear of missing out. You want to find out what's happening in the lives of your friends. That's why you always want to check your chat groups. Because if you don't, you will fear, you're afraid that you will miss out on something. And that's what you call FOMO. In fact, we are so you know, entrenched in this system that some countries have created laws because of this. For example, uh, there's a law that you cannot text while you drive. In, in China, in some European countries, they have now built texting lanes. <laughs> now, this is true, right? So in other words, the world has adjusted uh, in, 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 because of this, this is the world that we live in. So therefore, we're addicted. When you're an addict, there are symptoms. And let me show you the symptoms of addiction. Let's watch this uh, video. Across the globe, frustrated parents are forcing kids to go cold turkey on technology. Joking. Their reactions are not unlike the withdrawal symptoms of a drug addict. I know addiction when I see it, and I started seeing very clear signs of addiction in children, especially the withdrawal part. Get it back! You already live my ever! The mood dysregulation when an addict gets their drug of choice taken away from them. No iPad. <laughs> the temper tantrums, the violent outbursts. We started seeing more and more of those. How you doing, Dr. Mack? Dr. Kardaris, run. You know, the symptoms of addiction is anger, anxiety, depression. Now, do you see symptoms of that in those children? So what's the difference? And that's why many experts are saying there's no difference between a cocaine addict and a digital addict. Because when you take away this device from kids, they get angry. And in fact, the truth is, the person that they love the most, their parents, they get angry, especially when the parents take away these devices from them. And that's why I speak to parents, I speak to young people, I speak to all of us. Because as early as one or two years old, you know, we gave devices to our children. We make these devices their babysitter, right? It's so convenient. 
You know, we're so busy with other things in life, and you know, our kids are uh, uh, running around, and uh, you want them to stay quiet for a period of time, and what do you do? You give them a device, and suddenly, it's like magic, right? <laughs> suddenly, they are now quiet. But do you know that according to early child development experts, it doesn't help their brain development. Children need to work with their hands. In other words, you need to give them clay activities, playing in the sand, playing in the mud. They need to touch it with their hands. Their feet need to touch the soil, and that's how the brain is developed. But these digital devices are harming their brains. And therefore, we're not, give, we're not doing them a favor. We're not helping them to develop naturally as God designed them to, to, to develop, to mature. Their social media addiction. You know, in the Philippines, we'll always uh, like when we're number one in the Philippines. And we're, do you know that we're number one in time spent on social media we're for, the Philippine, for the Filipinos? We are number one, right? We're like, hey, we're number one in social media. Time spent in social media. We love social media. You know, anything we do, 24 hours a day, our entire life is posted on social media. You know, take selfies and stuff like that. There's multitasking. You will tell me and reason and say, you know, I'm not addicted. But do you know that when you work, Today, we multitask. For example, you're working on your Excel or, or, or your uh, uh, word processing, uh, word document, you're typing, and what happens? You get a text message. So now your attention fo uh, shifts from one task to another. And then again, another message pops out in your computer. And now you shift. Do you know that the brain is not designed to multitask? You know, some people argue about this, but it is proven that the brain does not have that ability. We are not a multi, our brains are not a multiprocessor. We're, the brains, the difference between the brain and the computer is the brain is a multiprocessor. It can do several activities at the same time. The brain doesn't have the capacity to do that. And according to studies, if you multitask, your productivity goes down by 40%. Versus you unitask, simply mean, you know, you work on your spreadsheet first, put away your digital devices, and then at a certain time of the day, then you check your devices, and then put it down, and then you shift to another task. But what do you do? We shift from one task to another quickly. And our productivity goes down by 40%. And today, the modern worker multitasks. And uh, you guys were telling me here at Singapore, you guys work really hard up to 8, 9 in the evening. So imagine if you unitask and your productivity increases, then perhaps you don't have to work very hard or work long hours. Now it's up to your boss. I do not know if your boss will allow you to go home. But you know, it depends. What I'm saying is you want your productivity to go up, do not multitask. So now let's look at the damaging effects of digital addiction. Will you ever do this to your child? You know, you, you go, you, 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 you look at your child, you come home, you know, I have something for you, I bought it outside, I think you like this, you know, this is called cocaine. Try this out, you will like it, you will enjoy it. No parent would ever do that. But you know, based from these findings, we are doing the same with our devices. We buy them a cell phone, we give them our cell phone when they come home, and they are so happy. And they are mesmerized with the screen. And they spent long hours in the screen. I know that because I used to love computer games. You know, there was a time that I played computer games when I was in college. You know, one of the, when the PC first came out, one of the invest, my dad invested on a PC. So back in the Philippines, when most families don't have a PC, we had a personal computer. So that introduced me to computer games. But of course, those computer games, the graphics are not so good at the time. But I got hooked. So I understand it. And there were times that after school, I would play the computer game for, I would start around 8 or 9 p.m. And before I knew it, the sun is already rising. I thought that I was just playing for one or two hours. 
But I did not realize that I spent the entire night, the entire evening, playing games. Now, those games that was introduced at that time were Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that. Uh, I didn't know that. And that's what happens when you're addicted. What happens in the brain is this. Our brain, it, 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 there, there's what you call dopamine flooding. Because dopamine is designed by God so that our brain can experience pleasure. When we experience pleasure, dopamine is released. Now, dopamine is a chemical messenger that carries a signal to the pleasure center of the brain, which is the reward circuit. As you take more and more of these things, you push the dopamine level higher and higher and higher. This is called dopamine flooding. This is what happens when you play video games. You know, you want to play more. You want to play more. Uh, your parents say, stop it, stop playing, you, but you want to play more. When you look at your devices, you want to you scroll uh, at, your, at, your, at your device, look at social media. You want more and more and more. It gives you pleasure. What happens is, when there's so much dopamine in your brain, and the brain is used to that increased level of dopamine, your brain becomes desensitized. What that means is you get this feeling that it, it numbs the brain to the point that any other pleasures become less exciting. And this is what Dr. Archibald Hart says. This condition is called anhedonia. The word anhedonia simply means, an means without, hedone means pleasure, without pleasure. So you now have a condition called anhedonia. You do not know it. And that means other forms of pleasure, apart from digital devices, do not give you pleasure anymore. So therefore, you hear children oftentimes say, I am bored. What that simply means is what you're offering to me does not give me excitement compared to the digital activity. So when they say, I am bored, usually they say it when they're not on their devices, right? Because when they're on their devices, they would not say they're bored. But when you're out, right, they don't have the digital device with them, they would say, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. Actually, what they are saying, please give me a digital activity. And the danger with this condition, and let me zero in, is that even your relationship with God becomes boring. And you suddenly find yourself, you don't want to read the Bible anymore. And you begin to find yourself, you don't want to pray anymore. Because it's boring. And I would say this, a child with an anhedonic condition cannot know an intimate relationship with God. And that's why this is very, very serious. Because it takes the place of God in their hearts. And not only children, but even adults are affected. It's the idea of I no longer feel anything. There's a story of uh, this father who wanted to bring his two sons to the woods to see his grandfather. And since they were digitally addicted, they didn't have to bring, they, they were not allowed to bring their devices. So they went to the woods, uh, there's a cabin there, and they met their granddad, and their granddad was so excited, and he said, he said to his grandchildren, we're going to have so much fun. We're going to have so much fun. We're going to go to the river. We're going to go fishing. We're going to go do that and do this. And then the grandson said, well, Grandpa, what are we going to do, what are we gonna do for fun? In other words, it doesn't excite them. These activities do not excite them at all. They don't know, they have never experienced fun with those activities. And many children are in this situation. They find it boring. Another uh, effect of digital addiction is inattention. You know, according to Dr. Dimitri Christaxis, a child's prolonged exposure to rapid image, which usually most, you know, you, you know the, uh, the, the video games for children, they are rapid images. The rapid image changes during this crit critical window of brain development preconditions the mind to expect high levels of input and leads to inattention later in life. So no wonder there are a lot of increased cases of ADHD. 
And there's depression. Now, depression is a big one. It has spiked ever since the iPhone was introduced in 2007. And Time Magazine, many years, several years ago, came out even with an entire article entitled Teen Depression and Anxiety, Why the Kids Are Not All Right. Now, let me show you some highlights of that article. Is, is some highlights. Major depression among teens in the U.S., especially girls, has jumped to 37% in the last decade. More than $3 million adolescents aged 12 to 17 reported at least one major depressive episode in the past year. An MDE, or major depressive episode, is defined as a period of at least two weeks of low mood that is present in most situations. I know this, even in the Philippines, a lot of young, a lot of parents come to me and tell me, my, kids is go my, my child is going to depression very frequently. Very frequent. You know, they would come to me, my child is going to depression, what are we going to do? Self-harm is on the rise. You know, researchers got 1.7 million search results for hashtag self-harm in 2014. By 2015, the number was more than 2.4 million. Associated with depression is self-harm, where you cut yourself. In the Philippines, suicide, we have the highest in Southeast Asia. 17.1% okay, for the 15 to 19 year old category. And many experts believe that this is the reason why. Because what happens is, well, basically the concomitant rise of social media and the smartphone. According to research, when you post in social media, you tend to compare yourself with one another. So when you post something, and then you get only one or two likes in your post, and then you look at your rival at school, you're a teenager, your rival at school, he or she posts something, and she gets 500 likes. How do you feel? And this contributes to depression, right? Well, at least somebody liked your post, two people. You know, instead of looking at the price, I look at, you know, there are more, you know, 498 people you know, did not even notice my post. So this is what I'm, I was saying earlier. Ever since the release of the iPhone in 2007, they surveyed middle schoolers, with the question of, I feel left out of things, I feel lonely, and it spiked since 2007. And what happened in 2007? That was a year when the iPhone was released. That's why many experts like Gene Twain said, there is compelling evidence that devices we place in young people's hands are having a profound effect on their lives and making them seriously unhappy. According to Kathy Koch, the five lies of social media is, I am the center of the universe. Therefore, you are developing an entitled child. Second, I deserve to be happy all the time. I must have choices. Why? Because their life is made up of menus, drop-down menus and choices in the cell phone. I am my own authority. Information is all I need. Therefore, I don't need teachers. Do you know the games your children are playing? A few years ago, a game came out. Uh, let me share with you an image of that game. I won't mention the title, but perhaps some of the kids know this game. And this game seems innocent. You know, it's an anime cartoon. And uh, it's sort of cute, right? But this game, let me share with you the description of Wikipedia about this game. Well, this game won the IGN's best game of 2017. People's Choice Award for Best PC Game, Best Adventure Game, it was runner-up, Best Story, and the most innovative. Now this is how Wikipedia describes this game. This game follows a male high school student who joins the school's literature club and interacts with its four female members. The game features a mostly linear story with some alternate scenes and endings depending on the choices the player makes. While it appears at first glance to be a light-hearted game, it is of, in fact a psychological horror game that involves heavy use of breaking the fourth wall. What that means is in this game, there is suicide, there is depression. The characters go into suicide, go into depression. Some of the characters commit suicide. And breaking the fourth wall means the goal is for the player. Suddenly, uh, one of the girls are reaching out not to the main character in the game, but to you, the player. 
And it's scary. And sometimes when you look at your child playing a game like that, you ask your child, what are you playing? And look at this game. Oh, yeah, it's so cute, cute. Okay, I'll leave you there. But do you know? You don't know. It's a psychological horror game. And these are the games that are popular. And the good news is it's free for download. So they can access it. In fact, when you start playing the game, it will give you a warning. And the warning is this. This game is not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed. Do you think an ordinary child will pay attention to that warning? In fact, they will say, wow, really? I'd like to play this game. I want to find out. You know, why, why is the warning here? But all I'm saying is this. Do you know the games that your children are playing? There's digital dementia. Well, that, what that simply means is, well, this is not, I think, proven yet. But what they're discovering is when your mind is so used to these digital devices, your cognitive abilities begin to deteriorate. I think that's true because you no longer tend to memorize things, right? When I was young, I memorized the phone numbers of our house, the phone number of my best friend, right? Today, I don't even know the cell phone number of my wife. I have 500 phone contacts on my phone, but I only know one, and that's my phone number by heart, but in my mind, I don't even memorize. In other words, we're so dependent on these smartphones that our cognitive abilities are deteriorating. We tend to not, you know, we tend to not use, we're so dependent on it. Now, lastly, and this is the most damaging of all, and that is pornography. Among all addiction, pornography is at the forefront. It's what we call now pornemic. It's a global epidemic. You know, everywhere you go into the world, there is pornography. And the average age, the first exposure to pornography is around eight or nine years old. And that's why, you know, when parents come up to me in our church, sometimes we have church retreats for father and son, and we have topic on sex. And then the parents will come to me, hey, pastor, my, my, my son is, is just 10 years old, and we're going to talk about sex. And I tell them, you know what? Almost 100%, your child has seen pornography already. So who would you rather teach them sex? Porno the pornography in the computer, in, in the internet, or you? And then they will say, no, 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 pastor, my son doesn't look at pornography. Come on, come on, come on. Wake up. Wake up. Your son won't g g go to you one morning and say, you know, dad, I watch pornography. Yeah, you, know, you know what I'm saying? They would hide it from you, but they go to school, and at school, even if they don't choose to look at pornography, their classmates do. And I'm, I praise God today, for example, uh, my, our school where my kids go to, they are starting the school year, and they are now in the policy to deposit all cell phones in the locker room before going to class for the first time. And many schools are doing that right now. Pornography, to make matters worse, there are 1.9 million hero cocaine users, 2 million heroin users, in the United States, compared to 40 million regular users of online pornography. Pornography is, is worse because it's like a poly drug. Because when you look at pornography, dopamine is secreted in your brain. It gives pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And of course, for all adults here, usually when a person uh, watches pornography, he wants to be excited. And what happens is when he gets excited, um, he, you, you will achieve orgasm. And when you achieve orgasm, it's like an opiate, okay? So if you know drugs, if you did drugs before, there is uppers and downers. So it's like a combination of upper and downer. That is why it is so, so addictive. You want that feeling oftentimes, and that's why it gets addictive. It's very, very addictive. You know what porn does? Number one, it desensitizes us to pleasure. There is now a condition known as PIED. This is the same as anhedonia. What happens is, many men who are hardcore, they watch pornography ever since they were young. They were exposed to pornography. They're addicted to pornography. They now have this condition, and they're seeking help. The condition simply is, their brain is so used to pornographic images that once they enter into a relationship, a sexual relationship, whether marriage or, well, well you know, 
they are not excited having sex with a real partner. But once they look at pornography in the computer screen, they get excited. But when they engage in real sex, they don't get excited. It's an erectile dysfunction. You know what happened? The brain is damaged. You know, experts say that the, the biggest sex organ is the brain, right? Since the brain is damaged, and that's why today they are asking for help. Not for, they want to be free from pornography, not for moral reasons, but for health reasons. They want to live a normal life. And there are groups now who are, you know, in many parts of the country, or sorry, in, in the world, where they have self-help groups for people in this condition. This is a case of anhedonia. In other words, the brain is so numb to these pornographic images that other forms of pleasure, a real partner, don't give them pleasure anymore. It is very scary, very dangerous. Next is hypersensitized to lust. In other words, it increases the risk of sexual aggression, even among kids. And thirdly, a crippled willpower. Now, this is the brain scan of, uh, on the right, right side is the healthy brain. And then in the middle is the brain on heroin. And the third part is the brain on porn. These are heavy porn users. Look at the damage it does to the brain. If you don't see it, if you don't notice it, but the brain gets damaged. What happens is your willpower is crippled because your brain is damaged. So the lies of pornography, it gives you satisfaction, it gives you a sense of purpose, it gives you a sense of freedom. I can do whatever I want, but the truth is you're addicted. You have a lost identity, you are enslaved. And what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us in Matthew 5 verse 29, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out. Throw it from you. It is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your, your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off, throw it from you. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What Jesus is saying is if you want to change, you strike at the root and remove it from your life. You need to make that change. Or some, perhaps some people call it cold turkey. You know, when you quit smoking, cold turkey. So that is what people who study these things advise. That the only way to get away from this is cold turkey. In other words, you need to stop. And that's why some solutions is this. And when I share these solutions, I know some of you will be shocked. But it's not the Bible, and you know, I, I won't debate on you so much on this. But if you are serious in wanting to help your child be free from this addiction, and you want them, most importantly, to have a growing relationship with God, this is my, these are the advices. No digital devices until the age of 12. Absolutely nothing. Some of you are saying, what? Is that possible? Okay, you cannot control their classmates, you cannot control their friends, but you can control your home. That's all I'm saying. No smartphones until the age of 17. You can give them a phone, perhaps in age of 12, but no smartphones by the age of 17. We apply this in our family. That's why, well, truth to tell, my heart breaks. Because I see the friends of my classmate, they have nice phones. But my eldest is 19, so I have a smartphone. And truth to tell, when I see him and my wife sees him on his phone, sometimes he scratches her head because, you know, he, well, that's our agreement. But I remember when he was turning 17 and he was asking me, when will I get a smartphone? And then I asked, why do you need a smartphone, right? I mean, you have a phone, an analog phone. You can call me anytime, you can text me. You know, that's, I think that's the main reason why you have a phone. When will I get a smartphone? So give me a reason why would I give you a smartphone? And you know, he gave a very good reason. This is what he said. While my teacher is lecturing in class, my teacher shifts the slide very fast. So I would take notes and the slides shift. 
I see my classmates taking photos. While I cannot, I don't have a smartphone. So what did I say? I'll buy you a camera. No, no, <laughs> I didn't say that. When he told me that, my heart broke. You know, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's something, you know the feeling of, I want to give in, but I know if I give in, I may not be helping you long term, but because of the pressure that you're experiencing, I want to give in. But you, when he said that, he was about 16 years old, I, we gave him a smartphone. And when we gave him a smartphone, this is what I said. Listen, son, here's your smartphone. Who bought this smartphone? You bought the smartphone. Therefore, who owns the smartphone? You own the smartphone. Okay, good. So, I'm going to lend you my smartphone. Right? And since I'm lending you my smartphone, anytime I want it back, I can get it. Because who owns it? You. All right, so you own it. That's very clear. Another thing is anytime we want to view the contents of our smartphone, we can because we own the smartphone. Okay, so we have an agreement, understanding. And thirdly, we're going to lend you the phone for you to use in school, but at night time, you're going to return the smartphone to us for safekeeping. And they will turn, return it to you tomorrow morning. And he said yes. In fact, I think my wife even printed a letter. A what? A contract. She signed the contract. Right? Downloadable. It's downloadable. We went to the lawyers. No, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> he signed the contract. But what are we teaching our children? The principle of stewardship. The problem with many kids who have their smartphones, they think they own it. And whenever you, can I, can I look at, why, why? Why do you want to, this is my smartphone. Right? You get this entitlement mentality. And therefore we have that agreement. And it's really a struggle because sometimes, you know, he would say, he would return it at 9 o'clock because the, the, the idea is he, he, he doesn't bring it to his room. He leaves it in the living room, goes up. And after a few minutes, he will go back. Hey, I lost, I, I need to check another message, you know. Hey, you're, already, you're already sleeping time, you know, but oh, it's very important, daddy, you know. So, you know, it's very difficult, the struggle, but we're doing it. Now, I, this is what I tell my son. When you are 21, uh, and we taught you guys this, with those who attended the retreat, remember the rite of passage? We strongly encourage that and recommend that. This is why I tell him. When you're 21, I'm going to release you into manhood. What that simply means is when you're 21, you will be your own person. You're now independent. And whatever you choose to do, we will no longer interfere. So what I'm saying to him, you know, son, this is not forever. Don't ever think you're 40 years old and we're still controlling your smartphone control. When you reach 21 years of age, if you want to play video games every day, it's up to you. You want to use your smartphone 24 hours, it's up to you. In other words, we're going to release you. You are now your own man. By God's grace, we have done our part. And you must seek your own destiny. And we will no longer interfere. You know, the, some, the problem with some Filipino parents, and I'm talking to the Filipino families, sometimes our children are 25, 30, and we're still controlling their lives. And that's very sad. What else? Give up on multitasking. View technology as a tool. What that simply means is, for example, there's something wrong in your house, a leak, a leak, uh, whatever. Uh, you get, what do you do? You go to the garage, you get the tool, you get the wrench, or you get the hammer, and then you go to the living room, you fix the problem, right? And then what do you do afterwards? Do you put the tool in your belt and say, you put a hammer in your belt and you walk around with a hammer on your belt? Of course not, right? What do you do is you return it to the garage. So the idea is you view your cell phone as a tool. You only use it when you need it. If you don't need it, then perhaps there are some situations you don't even have to bring it. Because it's so addictive. 
Establish a rule on team meetings, no gadgets. Proper sleep. One uh, research in the UK cites lack of sleep as the, one of the factors that girls get depressed. Because what happens is, when they bring their devices into the bedroom, and that's why we have a rule, you cannot bring your device to the bedroom, what do they do? They do not sleep. They chat with their friends. And not only that, you know, uh, sleep experts tell us we need to get seven, eight hours of sleep. In fact, for young children, up to nine, ten hours. And that means the reason why you have to sleep long hours is you have to go into that condition called deep sleep. When you go into that condition, your brain is recovers. What happens is this. Your smartphone has push notifications. Since it has push notifications, when your daughter, your son goes to sleep and the phone is beside him, he is so sensitive to the phone that a simple sound will wake him up and he wants to check the message because there's a fear of missing out. There's a new message from my friends. So they don't sleep and they go to school. They're, they're like zombies, right? And it, it's a, it contributes to their depression. And of course, uh -huh. exercise. I also need to exercise. Analog activities, non-digital activities, like board games and stuff like that. Give yourself time to think and be alone with a smartphone. Creativity starts when you set aside your smartphone. The reason why we don't create anymore is because we're so used to looking at our cell phone. I like what Brad Huddleston said. He's the author of Digital Cocaine. This is what he said. Our children under our care, listen to this, are not being discipled by us. They are being, they are being transformed by the culture through their devices. They are influenced. When we were young, we were not influenced by the culture because we didn't have devices. Today, they are so, so influenced by the outside world through their devices. What is eternal life? What is a relationship with God? What is a relationship with Jesus? If you're a child of God, you know how Jesus describes it? This is how he describes it in John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The word know is intimacy. Eternal life, in its essence, means an intimate relationship with God. The Greek word no, well, the, the word no used here is the same no that is used to describe sexual intimacy. In other words, you're naked before God. That is the intimacy that God desires for us. Is it eternal life that they may know you, God, not the devices. And Paul puts it this way. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing. Again, the word knowing. Ginosko. Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. For Paul, everything else in this world is nothing compared to knowing God. Today, we are so, so distracted. And then you tell me, I cannot discern the will of God. I cannot find God. I don't understand the Bible. And it's simply because you have, you don't really know God. You don't seek after him. Now, some more statistics, and then we'll close. Americans check their phones 80 times a day. 79% of Filipinos check their mobile phones within 15 minutes after waking up. One third of Filipinos can't live without cell phones. And Philippines is a world leader in social media usage. Contrast it to these statistics. 19% of churchgoers read the Bible every day. Only 3% of teens read the Bible every day. 
And 60% of Filipinos don't read or own a Bible. No wonder we are not intimate with the Lord. No wonder we don't know the Lord. You know, one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible for me is Psalm 27, verse 4. And this is what David wrote. He said, One thing I have asked from the Lord, and that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to meditate in His temple. You know, I don't know about you. When I read this verse, I get guilty. You know why I get guilty? I have this envy of David. Why does he have that? Where does he get that? That desire to know the Lord. The idea of beholding the beauty of the Lord. To be honest, I have a difficult time fathoming it. To look at God for hours and hours and hours. And now I know why. Because if Jesus were here today, he would say to the young generation, I hope you would look at me, look at me with the same passion and desire that you look at your phones. Because you're always looking at your phones. Hours and hours and hours. And as parents, we need to wake up. Because this world is turning away from God. And if you want your children, you want to raise them to become Christ followers, you need to wake up and do whatever is necessary. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, the truth is we are all in this, including myself, that this world is so much busy this world is, has so much media and information. We take a lot of things in that we have failed to quiet our hearts and our minds. To really listen to you. To really enjoy you. And now we know why. Because there are other things that take our hearts. And we come before you confessing how we have idolized other things apart from you. We call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves Christ followers. But we are no different from the rest of the world. So we come before you and ask that you forgive us. Lord, please forgive us and help us from this day forward live the life for me and for our family. That we will be intentional in doing whatever is necessary to help our family come to know you and live a godly legacy. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here at CCF Singapore. I thank you for their love and their passion for you and for your people here at Singapore. Lord, may you bless this church, oh God. Lord, use this church mightily here in Singapore. God reigns here in Singapore as we sang earlier. You reign, and you reign in our hearts. And may that reign in our individual hearts. May we effectively showcase that to the world here at CCF, here at Singapore, oh God. So that the people around us, people in the office, people in our neighborhood would see Jesus in us. And they would begin to wonder why. And they too will become attracted to the faith. Lord, help us to be salt and light here even wherever you send us, oh God. Thank you, Lord. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you very much.